Hi there, this is Nishant here welcoming you to a new part of our study on the chapter 6A deductions under section 80C to 80U. In this part, we will be learning about the sections 80JJA to 80PA. So, namely, there are four sections for us to study in this part, and the sections are 80JJA, 80JJAA, 80LA, and 80PA. So, every section except for 80JJAA are in respect of certain incomes. So, if you check the summary here, ATJJA stands for profits and gains from business or profession of an SSE in a certain kind of business. ATLA stands for incomes for offshore banking units. ATPA stands for incomes for producer companies. Whereas, ATJJAA is a new section and it is in respect of employment of new workmen. It is not in respect of any kind of profits. It's in respect of employment of new workmen. Also, if you look at the deductions for each of these sections, you will see ATWJA is for profit. This is for a kind of profit. This is also for profit. So, it's these three sections, JJA, LA and PA are all for profits. Whereas, ATJJAA is for additional employee cost. Alright. So, just keep that in mind. Okay. JJA, LA and PA are for kinds of incomes whereas JJAA, double J double A is for additional employee cost which is not an item of income rather it's an item of expense. So let's go to JJA. So section 80 JJA as I said previously is in respect of incomes from a certain kind of business and the kind of business here is collecting and processing of biodegradable waste and by collecting and processing biodegradable waste income tax act mentions four kinds of activities an SSC can perform with the biodegradable waste so collected and processed. So let's get into the section and have a detailed study on the section. First and foremost eligibility it can be any SSC, corporate or non-corporate, it doesn't matter. Any SSC can be eligible for this section. Next comes the crux of the section. What should the SSC do to be eligible for this deduction? So, it is a given thing that SSC should be in the business of collecting and processing biodegradable waste. But then that's not enough. Simply collecting and processing is not enough. Now, what do you utilize this collected and processed waste for? is the crux here. SSC can use this collected and processed biodegradable waste for either generating power, pretty common thing, biopower. Second, producing biofertilizer, pesticide, gas, bioagents, third one, organic manure. That is nothing but converting this collected bio waste, processing it, making it compost and using it as fertilizer or manure or pesticide or whatever it is, various items which is required for agriculture. And finally, for producing pellets or briquettes of fuel, for fuel, sorry. Mm, I'm assuming you do not know what pellets or briquettes are. Uh, by pellets or briquettes, what it means is they are a kind of organic matter which are made from bio waste, biomass, agricultural waste, etc. And these things can be used as a catalyst for creating energy, as in they can be used as fuel for energy creation. Alright, now this is what an SSE has to do by performing the business of collecting and processing biodegradable waste. So, use that waste and do any of the four activities or make, generate, produce any of the four things that I mentioned right now. Now, this alone is not enough. SSE also has to file returns as per section 139.1. So, the SSE, whether corporate or not, has to file their returns within the specified dates in section 139.1 and also make a claim in the return with respect to section 80 JJA. Fine? Alright. That's all an SSE has to do for claiming deductions under section 80 JJA. Now let's see what's the deduction an SSE can avail if he performs all these mentioned conditions. Now the deduction SSE gets is 100% of the profit earned from such business for the first five years from commencement. So, deduction available is 100% of profits from such business for 5 consecutive years from the commencement of business. So, the first 5 years from the beginning of the business, SSC can take the profits tax-free. Pretty simple section, right? 
all that you have to keep in mind is collecting and processing bio waste and using them using it for any of the four activities mentioned here plus return claim got it let's move to the next section that is JJAA and as I mentioned previously the next section is not in respect of an income it's in respect of an expense so deduction in respect of employment of new workmen it is a given that for an SSE to claim this deduction he needs to employ new workmen now the only thing crucial here is to understand who or what kind of categories of workmen can be categorized as new workmen so let's get to the section first and foremost who is an eligible SSE an eligible SSE is any SSE who is subject to tax audit under section 44 AB I'm not going to explain what tax audit under section 44 AB is as I had already taught you the same while we learned PGBP okay, that's an eligible SSE now instead of going to the conditions let's see what's the deduction SSE gets so the deduction SSE gets here is whatever he's paying for the new employees as their salary or whatever it is whatever let it be anything will turn as employee cost so whatever expense and SSE incurs as a part of employee cost for the new employees the 30 percentage of such cost can be claimed as a deduction for three assessment years got it so if an SSE incurs say rupees 1 lakh for new workmen in our relevant previous year then the SSE can take 30 percentage of that 1 lakh as a deduction for the current previous year and the next two years that is for total of three assessment years so 30,000 in the first year 30,000 in the second year and 30,000 in the third year so a deduction of an amount equal to 30 percentage of additional employee cost incurred in the course of such business in the previous year would be allowed for three assessment year including the year in which such employment is provided so if it's assessment year 2021 the year in which the employees are employed and the cost is incurred so if 1 lakh rupees is incurred in the assessment year 2021 the SSE can take 30,000 deduction for assessment year 2021 21 22 and 22 23 simple now that's all about the deduction now let's check what are the conditions to be satisfied so conditions to be satisfied I have split into two parts the first part is in respect of the business and what an SSE has to do in respect of that business the first condition business should be a new one it shouldn't be a business formed by any of reorganization activities no split up no reconstruction no reorganization no acquisition so it should be a business freshly set up from scratch books should be audited that's a given because it's mentioned tax audit under section 44 AB should be conducted for this SSE so books should be audited and submitted along with the return given thing and finally this deduction should be claimed in the return so three basic conditions and now going to the major condition the crux of this section understanding who an additional employee is and understanding what an additional employee cost us I'll first explain what an additional employee cost us by additional employee cost what it means is the total payments paid or any emoluments payable in respect of additional employees employed in the previous year so total emoluments paid or payable to additional employees employed in the previous year if you notice I have underlined paid or payable and employed the reason being paid and payable I'm presuming you guys know what it means by employed what it means is same as in take a case a company XYZ hires a person recruits an employee but then that employee is not actually given any posting so by January 2020 the company hires conducts a hiring campaign and hires say 10 employees out of 10 employees six employees are posted somewhere six employees are posted at various places 
six employees are posted at various positions in the organization but the rest of the four are yet to be posted now the posted employees who have actually started their work are the ones who are employed the others are employees but they are not employed for this section so any employee who has been recruited and has started his or her work with the organization is termed to be employed got it so that's the meaning of additional employee cost now by emoluments what it means is all payments except contribution to pension fund provident fund or any lump sum payment at the time of termination so every payment made to an employee except for retirement benefits fine every payment except retirement benefits right now let's see who are additional employees and how its treatment can be conducted so for understanding who an additional employee is we need to take a look at the business in two different point of views the first is whether the business is a new one and the second whether the business is an already existing one so for an existing business which has been functioning for the past couple of years a new employee would be an employee if employed would increase the number of total employees employed as compared to the last day of the preceding previous year okay i'll make that simple for an existing business an employee is said to be a new employee or an additional employee if the employment of such employee increases the roll number in their employee register in their laborers register so an employee will be considered as a new employee if the appointment and employment of that employee would result in increase of the total number of employees in that organization compared to the last day of the preceding previous year in such a case that employee would be considered as a new employee but if an employee is relieved from a business and another employee is brought in as a replacement of that employee there wouldn't actually be an increase in the number of employees when compared to the last year right because one employee left and instead of the employee left a new employee has come right so there is no actual increase in the number of employees in that case this cannot be considered as a new employee for section 80 jaa literally in the meaning of literal language in legality that is a new employee but for 80 jaa it won't be a new employee because there is no increase in the number of employees in the employee muster roll right because one employee left employee a left employee b took his position so there is no increase in the total number of employees right for new business we cannot make such a comparative study because we do not have previous year data so any employees employed in the previous year can be regarded as a new employee the most crucial part regarding additional employee cost is what's mentioned next whatever payment is being made to the additional employees if it is to be considered for 80 jaa is to be made in any mode other than cash by cash it means payment via legal tender that is normal cash and also by paying bearer check or bearer draft so it should be either by account pay check account pay draft or any electronic clearing system through a bank account fine so we learned what is additional employee cost crucial things paid or payable or employed and the meaning of definition of emoluments everything but retirement benefits okay then we learned how to see employees who are to be treated as new employees from the point of view of an existing business and a new business and the mode in which the payment is to be made fine you understood what an additional employee cost is now let's check who an additional employee is so in the explanation of additional employee cost we saw the first and foremost condition 
for considering a person as an additional employee for an existing business and that condition was that the employment of such new employees should result in the increase of the total number of employees as compared to the last day of the preceding previous year that's the first condition and i'm pretty sure that all of you have got it clear if at all you have any doubts as i always say write to me ask me through the chat window or message window or leave a comment so yes that's the first condition for a person to be termed as an additional employee the general condition now going to specific conditions now instead of telling you what are the specific conditions i'm going to tell you a set of exclusions set of exclusions wherein if an employee falls under any of the conditions mentioned in the exclusions that employee cannot be regarded as an additional employee so next comes a set of points wherein if an employee falls within any of those points will not be regarded as an additional employee at any cost so let's check what the exclusions are first employee whose total emoluments are greater than rupees 25000 a month so if an employee draws total emoluments more than rupees 25000 a month he or she cannot be termed as an additional employee right next point employee who has a government support for pension scheme so any employee for whom the government pays the entire contribution for employee pension scheme as per the employee provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act so first it was a limit of 25000 second was government's intervention as to the payment of the entire contribution to pension so if a government intervenes to pay the entire contribution to pension scheme no that party cannot be regarded as an additional employee third any employee employed for less than 240 days in the previous year so for an employee to be regarded as a new employee that party that person should have worked for more than 240 days replace 240 with 150 for footwear or leather industry so imagine an employee is employed in the last month of a financial year obviously that party that person will not get 240 days to work and as a result will not be able to be regarded as an additional employee for ATJJA but if but if this employee works for the next year as well and fulfills the 240 days gap the 240 days minimum days condition then the year in which this employee satisfies the 240 days conditions for the first time will be regarded as a year in which such additional employee was employed for the purpose of section 80JJA i'll put the example in terms of actual years so imagine previous year 1819 so previous year 1819 the last year march a new employee a set of new employees have been employed they work for 30 days for that previous year 1819 okay obviously they cannot be regarded as additional employees but for previous year 1920 out of the set of 10 employees employed in 1819 8 of the employees continue to work and they work for more than 240 days so the number of employees who finish the limit of 240 days being employed in the organization that is eight employees year can be regarded as additional employees in that year in which they finished 240 days that is a year 1920 got it so in respect of the previous year 1920 they'll be regarded as additional employees for 80 jjaa and for footwear leather industry replace 240 with 150 and go to the next section an employee who doesn't participate in rpf so for an employee to be considered as an additional employee that employee must be participating in recognized provident fund scheme got it so that's all about 80 jjaa i'll give you a quick summary once again the section is applicable for any sse who is required to conduct audit under section 44ab and if that's the case 30 percentage of the additional employee cost of the employer incurred by the employer can be taken as a deduction for 3 years from the year in which such employment is made and we discussed what is this cost we are talking about what all can be included in the cost should it be paid or payable and should the employee be employed or just recruited we discussed it here be about being employed being paid or payable and we discussed who an additional employees for an existing business and for a new business and the mode in which is to be paid and finally we discussed who can be actually considered as an additional employee the first condition same one we discussed here that is the employment should 
resulted in an increase in the total number of employees as compared to the last day of the preceding previous year and then we saw a set of exclusions a set of employees who are to be excluded from this set of considering an employee as an additional employee fine so let's go to the next section that is ATLA incomes of offshore banking units it's a pretty simple section nothing like ATJJAA it's pretty straightforward nothing what's happening so yes as always first of all eligible as you see a scheduled bank with an offshore banking unit in a special economic zone so without saying anything further it's pretty much given that the SSE should be a banking unit right but not any banking unit the banking unit should have satisfied certain conditions the first condition being it should be a scheduled bank with an OBU with the SES so that is one category of eligible SSEs second one any bank incorporated under law of any other country with an offshore banking unit in says so two kinds of banks one is a scheduled bank the and the other is a bank incorporated under any law of another country but has an offshore banking unit that's what OBU stands for in a special economic zone now going to the last category of eligible SSEs a unit of an international finance services center in short IFSC so these are the three categories of SSEs who are eligible to claim reduction under section ATLA right by offshore banking unit what it means is a branch of a bank in India which is located in says but then has acquired permission under specific section under banking regulation act to function as an offshore banking unit so a branch in says but has acquired permission from Banking Regulation Act 1949 to function as an OBU and by International Finance Service Center what it means is an international finance center which is approved by the central government and is eligible to function in a SES so just keep that in mind you will not be questioned in the meaning of an OBU or an IFSC but just keep that in mind what it means okay Okay, now let's check the conditions that an SSE has to satisfy for gaining eligibility for deduction under Section 80 LA. Namely, there are two conditions. One condition is in the form of a certificate from a chartered accountant, and the second condition is in respect of a permission. Okay, so getting into detail, an SSE has to gain a certificate from chartered accountant in respect of a report in Form 10 CCF, certifying that the deduction has been computed correctly the deduction has been claimed correctly so that is certificate of CA that's what certificate of chartered accountant stands for so wherein there's a report in form 10 CCF wherein the chartered accountant certifies the deduction claimed has been computed correctly second condition as I said is a permission and that permission is from Banking Regulation Act under section 23 1a and that is a permission that I was talking about which a bank should take to function as an OBU in assess so submit those two things along with the return the SSE will be eligible for claiming this deduction so we discussed who an eligible SSE is and what the eligible SSE has to do to claim deduction now let's check what the deduction here is so the deduction here is to be studied in two parts the first part is for an international financial service center sorry international finance service center and the next part is for an OBU in CES. for both of them the deduction is available for 10 years but the quantum is what differs so let's check how it differs so first for an IFSC unit the deduction is in form of 100 percentage of profits for any 10 consecutive years out of the 15 years from obtaining permission so let's say an IFSC unit obtains permission during the previous year 2010-11 then such IFSC unit will be eligible for claiming deductions for a set of 10 consecutive years for any set of 10 consecutive years between the period of 2010-11 to 2025-26 all right sorry not 25 26 24 25 so for the first 15 years from obtaining permission the SC can choose a set of 10 consecutive years wherein 100 percent of the profits will be tax free now for any other case that is for an OBU the deduction will be as follows 
for five years from the year in which permission is obtained, hundred percent of income. For the next five years, fifty percentage of income. So again, it's a total of ten consecutive years, but the set of years starts from the set of years for which the deduction has to be claimed starts from the first year from when the permission has been obtained. The SSC is not given a choice of any 10 years within 15 years or anything of that sorts. So if an SSC gets permission from 2010-11 for the first set of five years from 2010-11 to 14-15, SSC can take deduction of 100% of income and from 15-16 to 19-20, SSC can take a deduction of 50% of income. So what we discussed till now was the quantum of deduction available for the income earned by the SSC. But then Income Tax Act has set out certain specific conditions on what is to be considered as an income for this section. So let's see what all incomes can be regarded as income for this section. So first, an income earned from an offshore banking unit in CIS. So any income earned by an offshore banking unit in CIS can be regarded as income for this section. Second, any income earned by way of convertible foreign exchange in accordance with FEMA Act 1999. FEMA stands for Foreign Exchange and Management Act. Alright, so if a unit receives any income by way of convertible foreign exchange as per FEMA Act 1999, it can be regarded as an income for this section. And finally, an income earned by an undertaking in incest by doing business as mentioned in section 6.1 of Banking Regulation Act. This is not so important, but just keep in mind any income from an OBU in says any income by foreign exchange from FEMA, any income by doing business under section 6.1 as per Banking Regulation Act will be considered as eligible income for this section. Now that's all for section 80LA. Let's move to the last section for this part. That is 80PA section. 80PA that is income of producer companies. Sorry, it's not income of producer companies. It's deduction in respect of income of producer companies. So before going to the section, you need to know what producer company means. What all companies can be termed as producer companies. So straightforward, a producer company is nothing but a company as defined under section 581A of the Companies Act 2013. Now that doesn't necessarily tell you what a producer company is, right? You just understood that a company which has been defined under section 581A of the Companies Act 2013 can be regarded as a producer company. But in short, producer company is nothing but a company which has been formed for making the functioning of agricultural industry better. So it can be defined as a legally recognized body of farmers or agriculturists with an aim to improve the standard of living of the farmer community, the farmer fraternity, the agriculturist fraternity. So any company which has been formed by a group of farmers or agriculturists for improving the standard of living to ensure better status, to give good support for this farmer agriculturist fraternity can be termed as a producer company if they do everything necessary as per section 581A. So keep in mind producer company, farmers and agriculturists improving their situation. Got it. Now let's check the conditions which is to be fulfilled for claiming this deduction. First condition turnover in any previous year should be below rupees 100 crores. Second condition is in respect of the businesses that a producer company can carry out. So if the producer company carries out any of the next three businesses, then they can take deduction under section 80 PA. So these are the three activities. Study A and C first and then B. A and C is in respect of the produce grown by its members. So a producer company can market the agricultural produce grown by its members to claim section 80 PA. Also, they can process the agricultural produce of their members. So the produce of the members can be processed or marketed. Those two activities are eligible. Next activity, that is activity B is purchasing materials, requirements, resources for their members. So purchasing agricultural implements, seeds, livestock or articles for the members also qualify. Alright, so we saw who a producer company is 
and what are the conditions that they need to satisfy two conditions one conditions in respect of the turnover and the turnover should not cross rupees 100 crore in any previous year so if at all the turnover of that company crosses 100 crore in one previous year then for the rest of the following years they cannot claim deductions under section 80 ba and the second condition was in respect of the business that they carry out we discussed three businesses which are categorized as eligible businesses and out of the three two were in respect of the produce of the members and one was in respect of the materials that they supply to the members right so we discussed about the SSC and the conditions that an SSC needs to fulfill now moving on to the last part of this section that is a quantum of deduction the quantum of deduction for such producer companies will be hundred percentage of the profits and one more thing, one more thing that I left out is that they need to file a return as per section 139.1, right? Now the quantum of deduction, 100% of profits, nothing else. There is no yearly limit, there is no limit as to the number of years this deduction can be claimed or anything of that sort. Plain outright 100% deduction of profits until the year in which they achieve rupees 100 crores as turnover. So that's all about section 80 PA and with that we have come to the end of this part that is 80 J J A to 80 PA and one more thing regarding 80 PA I had left this throughout this deduction is not available from the assessment year 25 26 all right it shouldn't be a botheration for you guys as of now because this won't affect your examinations and the questions as of date and as of this assessment year but then just keep in mind from assessment year 25 26 this section will not be applicable so I hope you guys understood all the sections that we dealt in this study I'll quickly go to the summary table which we learned at first and summarize all the sections so here it is the first section we learned in this part was 80 JJA in respect of an SSE who carries out business of collecting and processing biodegradable waste Four purposes this waste can be used generating power, producing fertilizer, manure, pests, uh, pesticides, etc., and pellets. So, if an SSE does all that, that SSE can take a deduction of 100% for the first five years of commencement. Then we went to the section of 80 double J double A, wherein if an SSE employs new workmen, an SSE can take deduction for additional employee cost at 30% for three assessment year from the year in which such additional employee is employed. Then we went to ATLA, incomes of offshore banking units, wherein we learned what an offshore banking unit is, what an IFSC is, and how their deductions work. Deductions work in two parts, two ways. For IFSC, it's 100% for 10 years. For other cases, it's 100% for first five years and 50% for the next five years. Right. And finally, ATPA, income from producer companies. That is 100 percentage of profits from eligible business until the year in which they achieve a turnover of rupees 100 crores. So I'm presuming you understood all the sections under this study, this part pretty clearly. If at all you have any doubts, please write to me. I'll be more than happy to help you out. So in the next part, we'll be learning deductions 80 QQB to 80 U. Let's go to part 8 of our study, 80 QQB to 80 U.